champ. Right. <laughs> well, welcome back to uh, Rochester. Thank you. Also, um, today is about learning as much as we possibly can about you, but also maybe having a little fun mm -hmm. along the way. So let's go ahead and start from the beginning, all right? Where did you specifically grow up, and when did you learn to play the sport of golf? Uh, I started playing when I was about seven years of age. I live right in the centre of England. I actually live 15 minutes from quite a famous course in the UK. Well, held the Ryder Cup many times, uh, the Belfry Golf Club. And the British PGA just happened to be based there as well. So uh, it's uh, a place that one or two of you in the, in the room will be familiar with. And uh, occasionally get the chance to play the course at the Belfry, but, but not too often because I'm obviously quite busy. But uh, yeah, that's, that's where I grew up and that's where I live nowadays. So you were the European Tours Rookie of the Year in 1989. Can you talk about what the pressure was like on you after you won an award like that? Uh, 89 was the first year on tour. What a shocking picture. Oh my God. <laughs> I was, I was, uh, we're going to give our shout. Pat Kravitz back in the corner there was able to find that, that little bad boy. Thanks very much for that. I appreciate it. <laughs> but I actually played in, in 88. Uh, in the, the Open Championship at Royal Lytham as an amateur and won the silver medal. And I played the last day on Sunday with Jack Nicholas and Paul Lazinger looking like that. <laughs> so, you know, I apologise to Jack and Paul for, for my past, but uh, no, that is a shocking picture, I'm so sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> well, talk about the expectations, though, after you win yeah. the, the Rookie of the Year. That's, that's monumental. Yeah, my first year on tour, I mean, it went, obviously it went great, you know, you're never sure how you, your career's going to pan out, um, but I'd achieved everything as an amateur I wanted to achieve, uh, and after the Open experience, I thought now's the time to turn pro, and uh, my first few events went fantastically well, I, I, did, I missed the cut in the first one, in, I remember in Tenerife, then finished third the following week in Dubai, another third position about six weeks later, and then I actually won my first tour event. Uh, in my ninth event. So in 10 weeks, I had two thirds in a first position the first year on tour, which you know, enabled me to pick up the rookie of the year. But it, the next year didn't go quite so well. The expectation level sort of rises a little bit. And you, you, expect, you, know, you expect to be competing and sometimes that doesn't happen. You know, I think I got off to such a fast start uh, that it was inevitable that I may have some sort of reaction. Uh, I had an injury at the end of 89. I had to have an operation on my wrist, and that set me back a few months. And uh, you know, my game wasn't quite so good in '90, but uh, it got better in '91. We'll get to that. <laughs> we'll get to way. that. We'll one, get to yeah. that. Um, so you win six times on the European Tour. Can you talk maybe about some of your fondest memories playing the Tour? Um, yeah, my, I mean, my, I think my biggest win is was the French Open. Uh, it just happened to be at Paris National, where the Ryder Cup was last year. I'm not going into the Ryder Cup because we did quite well out there. But uh, it's certainly, you know, it, it is a fantastic course, Paris National. Yeah, one of my favourites in Europe. Uh, luckily enough to, to win a senior event there on the Stage Your Tour in Europe as well. So, as I say, horses for courses. So that's, you know, that's fond memories of playing Paris National. Uh, I think I won the tournament by eight shots. So you can actually enjoy playing that last hole albeit it's one of, the hardest, one of the difficult finishing holes in golf, I would say. But, uh, you know, with an eight-shot lead, I could relax a little bit and, and enjoy the occasion. So, you know, they're great memories of playing that course. Um, but all my wins are special, you know. Good. Good, yeah. It's tough to win out on tour, on any tour. So, you know, any time you get the chance to win, you've got to take it and, and enjoy it. So let's fast forward to 2015 when... By golly, you are the rookie of the year on the senior tour in, in 2015. That doesn't happen with everybody. Um, are expectations a little different? How's your game at about that stage of your life? When I finished on the main tour in 2012, I played a couple of events that year. My game was a mess. It wasn't good. I'd, again, I'd had a shoulder injury in the latter part of 2010. Uh, 11, I played poorly. And 12, I would, I, I'd lost my card. And I, w I was starting to play in the UK. I used to play in uh, the PGA Pro-Ams. I was now finished on the main tour. Uh, I knew I'd got three, three and a half years to 
my 50th birthday. Uh, and I met an old pal of mine, a PGA pro, uh, at this tournament that I'd just won. And he was asking me how I'd play, and I said, I played shocking. I've no idea what I'm doing. My game's a mess. And he said, well, come and, come and see me. And his, my remit to him was, right, you've got three and a half years to sort this mess out, because when I'm 50, I want to hit the ground running. And we worked hard, and you know, I was talking to Sue, I had the chance to play in pro-ams and test out what we were working on. So it was, you know, it was a really good three and a half years. It was probably the best thing that could have happened to me was to lose my card when I did, and then I had time to really focus on my game and get it in shape. Because when you're playing on tour week in, week out, you just haven't got time to make big changes, and the, the big changes have to work straight away. Otherwise, they get thrown out straight away. So I worked hard for three and a half years, up until I'm 50, and as you said, I hit, hit the ground running. Uh, in 2015 by winning the, the Rookie of the Year. But it was, it was those three and a half years of hard work and change that uh, enabled me to do that. So uh, for the amateurs in the room, are, are there any tips that you can give them regarding on some of the things that you were working on over that three year period? Any words, bits of advice that you might be able to share? Uh, yeah, um, again, we were talking last night to Susie uh, over dinner and I actually carry a mirror around with me, and I practice now looking into a mirror. And it's not to check my hair or how good I look on the course, but I place the mirror in front of me, and it's to check my eye line. I used to look at the ball, what I consider, now I know is badly incorrect. I always used to look at the ball with my head tilted this way. And for years, for 25 years, the club in the backswing was always way behind me, and I could never get it out in front. So I always play with a big, dirty hook. And my driving was not consistent. Um, my long game wasn't particularly consistent. Uh, and that's what we changed. We changed my eye line, the way I look at the ball. Uh, and I keep a mirror when I'm practicing in front of me so I can check that my eye's in the right position. I've also added to that because I've, uh, I, I have a tendency to follow the club head back with my head. So my head moves this way, again, which encourages the club inside. So I'm now a customer of Starbucks. And I, when I go into Starbucks, I sort of pinch a few of the wooden stirrers. And now in my practice routine, I look in the mirror and actually put a Starbucks, well, I'll say a straw, in my mouth. And when I take the club head away, if my head moves with the club head, I can see the straw moving as well. So it's basically a way of keeping my head still. If I keep my head still, it doesn't go this way. It stays still the club head goes back on a better line. And as a result, I don't now hit a dirty hook. I hit it pretty straight. And, Two know. things with this. I think <laughs> I see that Starbucks is going to be a sponsor of yours moving forward on the rice leave over here. Um, and I think a new drink here is going to be called the dirty hook. I, I, think, that would, I think that would work well here. Um, I think you're a perfect example of getting better with age. You've won five times on the senior tour including two majors. Um, are you playing the best golf of your yeah. career now? Like I said, my long game is, is so much more consistent. You know, I've actually become a decent driver of the ball where, I mean, my driving, my driving stats would be 30, 35% fairways hit you know, in, in my 23 years on tour. It's a lot better than that now. And, you know, and, and that breeds confidence, you know, certainly in my long game. I mean, I used to be a really, I say I used to be a really good putter, but I don't know whether you've got clips of last year. You may have. Uh, so the, the, there might be some questions asked about the putting. <laughs> but, but, we'll uh, get, we'll my, my, yeah, my long game is much more consistent nowadays. And, you know, and, and, and that can only help playing out here on the Champions Tour. You know, it's, it's a tough tour to play. Uh, and you, your game has to be A1. You mentioned 1991. Mm -hmm. All right, the Ryder Cup at Kiowa Island. Um, some say that was a Ryder Cup that uh, put the Ryder Cup on the map. You went 2-0 and in that Ryder Cup. Um, there was a lot that happened during that week. Mm -hmm. Maybe just share a couple of some of your memories. Um, that can be shared in a public audience. Okay. <laughs> Um, I mean, first of all, I was totally in awe of, of, of the European team 
you know, we had the likes of Seve Ballesteros, Nick Faldo, uh, Bernard Langer, uh, Ian Woosnam, uh, Alathabal, Monty was a rookie the same as me. But I was in awe of playing with these guys. I mean, it was my second, third year on tour. Uh, you just I literally, like I'd, I'd never played with Nick Faldo. Uh, I had to arrange a practice round with Nick Faldo three weeks before the Ryder Cup because I'd never played with him before. So I was, yeah, I was pretty much in awe of, of my team. I knew the names of the, the US team, but I'd only played with Paul Azing, I think, at the time. So, but you yeah. belonged on that team. I belonged on that team, yeah. I'd qualified. I qualified in the very last event in Europe. Uh, I needed to finish second on my own to get in the team and lost in the playoff. So, uh, yeah, I'd worked my way in. Uh, and I felt as though I belonged there because I was playing the, some of the best golf of my life. But uh, in that company, I wasn't so sure. But... Um, so, I mean, it's great memories. But I, I actually had to sit out the first three... Um, matches, which was you know, tough to take because I knew I was playing really well. I probably didn't expect to play in the foursomes because, as I said, I had a dirty hook in the bag. So that was not great for foursomes right. golf. But I, I was always a, a birdie machine those days. Um, like I said, I was a good putter uh, and thought I could really contribute in the four ball. But, you know, my captain there, Bernard Gallagher, He's the man that picked the team, and you know, I had to sit out until Saturday afternoon when I was paired with Ian Woosnam. And I'll tell you a little story. Um, we were on the practice area, and this, we left the practice area, and we had to walk to the first tee. It's quite a long walk down to the first at Keir Island. And uh, Ian Woosnam had played a few games with uh, Nick Faldo, and they'd putted terribly, both of them. Um, and, and Gallagher decided to split them up. So I got Ian, and we walked to the first tee, and I'm on my first Ryder Cup, having it a shot, sat around for two days. Uh, and he put his arm around me. He said, uh, Brody, he said, I know you're a really good putt. He says, I'm putting terrible. He said, if you see anything, just let me know. Now, Ian Woosnam had just won the Masters in April. <laughs> he was world number one, and he's asking a rookie about his putting. <laughs> I don't think I could imagine Tiger Woods asking a rookie, you know, for advice like that. But... You know, it, did it put you I mean, at ease? Well, exactly. I, I mean, whether he did it on purpose or not, I'm not sure. And I'm a good pal of Ian Woosnam nowadays, and he still won't admit to that whether it was a, a ploy on his behalf. But it, it certainly worked. And, you know, I went to the tee thinking, right, you know, I've got to do my little bit. So, uh, yeah, and I, I think I contributed enough for us to sort of certainly win that match. And, uh, yeah, it was, you know, great memories playing. Uh, but obviously we, we lost that one, so uh, it was a little bit disappointing. Well, you talked it. about how stacked the team was. I think you have a, uh, an image here of the team. I mean, there's a whole bunch of Hall of Famers mm -hmm. on, on this list. Do you, now, do you, you recognize the guy top right, third from the right? <laughs> He's quite famous over here now. Um, he looks like he might have uh, spent a lot of time on television. Correct. Right? We always said he was a comedian. Even in 91? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Are there any stories you can no, tell about no, David Faraday? No, I, I can't. I'm, honestly, I, I mean, I obviously know David, but I don't know him that well. So, uh, no, I, there's nothing that really springs to mind. But I know he's well thought of over here nowadays, and he's done fantastically for himself. He's uh, a great friend of the PG of America, a great friend of golf's. Um, we were talking a little bit last night as, as we look at all these legends um, on... Uh, on your European team, uh, and we were talking about the best golfers in the world that you have seen, and you kind of take a different approach to a identifying bit. categories on the A best. little bit. Say, I, I, I like think that? it's really difficult to pick out one player as the best player that, you know. I mean, I said, you asked me about Europe and America, and I, in America, I, I went with Jack Nicklaus because I was blown over playing with him as an amateur. I thought he played incredible golf at Royal Liven. Uh, but generally, I, I tend to pick out the categories, like putting category, the best putter I've perhaps ever seen was undoubtedly Tiger Woods, and I'd perhaps put Luke Donald in that category when he was world number one. Uh, Luke used to put fantastically well, and I think that his putting is not quite as good as it used to be. Uh, iron play, uh, Alathabal. 
If Alassabal could have hit the big stick, if he could have ever driven the ball well, he would have won multiple majors. I know he won. Did he win two? Yeah, Masters twice. Um, but he would have won a lot, lot more. The world, he was such a poor driver of the ball, but his iron play was incredible. Short game, I'd sort of Seve and Alassabal again. And I said to you last night, I'd perhaps put myself in the top five because my short game used to be. I'm getting older now. The nerves are not quite as, as they were, but uh, my short game was... I was blessed with a good short game because I got a big dirty hook off the tee. So. <laughs> Is that uh, all of them? Uh, driving, driving. Uh, in Europe, I'd pick Lee Westwood out because Lee Westwood drives it incredibly well. And USA, David Duval, at his peak. I played with him at Carnoustie uh, when David, I think he was Rookie of the Year in about 96, and I played with him in 97. And he hit driver. I don't know whether you get guys and ladies have played Carnoustie, but it's... Really narrow golf course, little tiny pot bunkers, similar to the ones I've seen out here, actually. High faces. You get in them, it's sideways. And David Valet driver everywhere around Carnoustie when I played with him, and he just hit it pure. It was nice. one of the best driving displays I've ever seen, so he'd be right up there as well. David Duvall. Um, Oak Hill. You hit some golf balls yesterday. I did in, in the this cold, yeah. yeah we... Chamber of Commerce weather. Right. <laughs> yeah, we practiced uh, at balls for an hour or so. Couldn't quite reach the, the markers on the top of the hill at 250. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> need to get in the gym, I think. But no, it was, it was a bit chilly and it was into the wind. But, uh, Did you get out onto the golf course? We had a little... You... Um, yeah. Uh, I can't remember his name. Was it Max? Max, Max took me around in, in, the, in a cart and uh, we had a little look at the golf course. Um, yeah, it looks, looks great. I was really surprised coming out of winter how much growth there is on the golf course. Because in the UK, when we come out of winter, it's basically dirt and mud. There's no grass there at all. And it's sort of April, May where the grass comes through in the UK. Here, you've got a full coverage already. So I'm sure the course will be immaculate come May. So um, we were talking earlier, many people might not remember that you were here in 1995 working as a television mm -hmm. analyst uh, for European TV yep. uh, uh, on the European side, and Larry Mize was doing the American television yep. side. Um, is it tough to remember what you saw here in 95, <laughs> what you remember, and maybe the quick ride around with Max on? on yeah, I, I, I sort of remembered a lot of the holes. You know, the, certainly the finish, 14, 16, 17, 18. Couldn't remember 15. And when I saw it like yesterday, it terrified me. <laughs> oh my God, the green's about this big. And you can't miss it left, you can't miss it right. And, you know, so, yeah. I mean, I, what I did notice out there is that it looks as though you have to play below the flag. A lot of the greens run back to front. Uh, so, you know, those back pin positions are going to be tough to get to. Uh, but uh, it looks a, a real good test. Uh, not quite as I remember it, because I remember it with quite a few more trees. And I think over the past 25 years, 600 trees or so have been taken down. So the, as the, the outlook of the course is a bit wider, but when you stand on the tee, it's still as narrow as ever, just without you know, some of the trees that perhaps weren't, you know, weren't needed really to make it tight. But, uh, and of course, seeing the video from 2008, the rough was <laughs> like this. So yeah, I'm sure it'll be a real good test for us. Yeah, but David Charles, how, how deep's the rough gonna be here for Paul? Not very. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, let's leave Oak Hill and let's go back to Benton Harbor, Michigan and remind everybody in the room what happened last year. Alfred has born trophy at stake. 79th KitchenAid Senior PGA Championship. Eagle 2 that drops. <laughs> 52-year-old Englishman Paul Broadhurst. Six birdies and the first eight holes out in six under 30. Yeah, anything just
just to the right. Put a little spin on it. That's nice. Just below the hole. So true or false, Paul, after shooting a 72 in round one, you went and made a phone call to your travel agent trying to book a flight home. Correct. <laughs> I was right on the cut mark, and I thought, if I miss the cut, I really don't want to stay here till Monday morning. You know, you, know, you miss the cut, you want to get out of there. So I did. I rang my travel agent and said, what's the first flight out here Saturday morning, just in case? Uh, and he said, well, there is one, but it's going to cost you $1,500. So that was my incentive Friday to make the cut. <laughs> As Lorraine, your wife, everybody say hello to Lorraine. Um, <laughs> there's a winking at you down there. But yes, um, do me a favor. Take a look at this slide and answer um, this multiple choice question for us, OK? <laughs> the question is, what's more impressive? Posting a 66, 64, 63 in the final rounds of a major championship. B, winning a major championship by four strokes. Or C, matching the best 72 hole <laughs> score, 19 under, 265 in championship history. Uh, per oh, that's a tough, tough one. Personally? I'd go for A. I would agree with you. Just for self-confidence. Because now I know I can shoot those scores on a, you know, consecutively. Whereas previously, I wasn't sure. I knew I could win a major, not necessarily by four, but by two. But, uh, and I've shot 21 under once before. Not in a major, but, you know, so I know I can, I'm capable of shooting those figures. But, but 66, 64, 63, that's pretty special. So we talked a little earlier about um, your putting. This, this doesn't happen <laughs> unless Jupiter aligns with yeah. Mars, right? Talk about your putting that week. Uh, well, I, I just think the greens, they were not ridiculously quick. They were quick, but not in the 12, 13 stint range. And they were a little bit European looking. That's what I felt. Um, Jack Nicklaus Golf Course. Yeah, but they, you know, it's, they did, they looked a little bit European. Um, and it was a course I'd played two years before. And in the last round, I, I shot four under in 2016, the last round, but I made eight birdies in that. Uh, that hook was back in the back. <laughs> but, um, so I knew I could play the course. Uh, and it was, it was just one of those weeks. Um, yeah, my putter was red hot. I mean, I've never held so many 35, 40 footers in my life. Uh, and, you know, you look at that and you think, there's nothing wrong with this putting. It is not like that every week, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> if it was, I would be in the winner's enclosure a lot more than I am. But uh, it, was just, it was just an incredible week. The first round, I couldn't buy a putt, which is why I shot one over. But I knew I was playing well tee to green. Um, second day, I made a few, obviously. And then Saturday, Sunday, I made everything. You know, 
first hole, I, on Sunday, I had a good tee shot, a really poor nine iron. Pin was back left, and I've hit it back right. A 40-footer across the green, down the slope, in the hole. <laughs> and that's how it all started, you know? And you've just seen the one on 14. You know, I just missed the green left, got the wrong side of the pin. I'd got no chip at all. Tried to be cute and check it at the top of the hill. Of course, it didn't check, and it's away down the hill. And, uh, you know, a whole 30-footer for, for par. And then you think, well, you know, my name's on the trophy, really. You know, you, you start to think that way. So after you win um, <clears throat> this major championship, there are a number of things you have to do as champion. You have to... Uh, go to reception, you have to do media interviews, you have to sign a bunch of whole flags. Uh, we kept you there pretty late. A long time. Uh, you were the last one probably <laughs> to leave the property. And uh, there, ah, Lorraine, beautiful. Um, so I guess my question is, what did you and Lorraine do after you um, left the golf course that night to celebrate? Like you said, everywhere was closed on a Sunday. The hotel we stayed in, the restaurant was closed. So we ended up going for a lovely meal at Applebee's. <laughs> <laughs> Dining style. Yeah. Uh, is Chef still here? <laughs> uh, no, just, we're going to have to make sure um, Oak Hill stays <laughs> open <laughs> really, really late. Um, what's your schedule going to look like uh, leading up to the championship here in Rochester? Uh, well, I'm, I'm planning to arrive on Sunday, on the Sunday before. Um, we'll practice Monday and program Tuesday. And then Wednesday, I'll probably take it pretty easy. I'll practice some, you know, a few puts and work on bits that I think, you know, need, need work on. But uh, lead up to that, I know I've got four weeks, got quite a long run on the Champions Tour leading up to that. Uh, but I will go home the week before, see my coach. I think we're only home for five days and then fly back out on the Sunday before the tournament. So uh, it's a pretty busy schedule. But, uh, you know, I like to come into majors having played a few tournaments, not necessarily the week before, but you know, two or three weeks before. I like to be, feel as I'm in control of the game and know what I'm working on and, and how the game's performing. So. Good deal. Um, Lorraine tells us that you're as competitive on the golf course as you are off the golf course. Is, is that a fair statement? <laughs> I'll say yes. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Broadhurst and Rochester's own Bob Duffy are going to take on Susie Whaley and Chris Nowak over here in a competition now to end all competition. So I fear everybody in the front row because mm. we're going to call that our splash zone right now. So you can't move.